In my review of the Panasonic G80 or G85, I said that it was in my view the best micro four thirds camera produced to date. That was balancing price, size and performance. There are better micro four thirds cameras for specialist needs like high speed sequencing or out and out video performance. But for me the G80 represents the heart and soul of the system. So when I saw a Panasonic G1 for sale, I thought it'd be interesting to compare them and see what developments there had been. The G1 was the first truly modern digital camera which owed nothing to the history of the DSLR. An interchangeable lens camera with no mirror. We're used to mirrorless cameras from many makers now, but first reactions were much like the reaction to the first jet plane. How can you have a plane without a propeller? Just substitute mirror for propeller. I must say that my first impression of the G1, that it was rather dainty. The G80 looks functional rather than dainty, and while of a similar width to the G1, is taller and deeper. It is also 30% heavier at 505 compared to 385 grams. That makes the G80 much less baggable, but contributes to its more mainstream camera feel. The control layout has evolved considerably, with the G80 packing far more functionality onto the camera back, while at the same time contriving to make it feel more spacious. The top plate has changed too, the G1's combined exposure and drive mode dials being split, and the focus lever moved to the back. Notable by its absence on the right of the G1 top plate is what is now standard on all Micro Four Thirds cameras, the red dot video button. That was an eminently sensible design decision on Panasonic's part, since the G1 doesn't do video. While the G80 has five physical function buttons, the G1 has only one, and it offers a very limited though well chosen range of options. The same applies to the quick menu, which has fewer options and works in a rather clunky way compared to its descendant. In spite of what I say, there is nothing in the functionality that makes the G1 difficult to use. On the other hand, I can't find any change on the G80 that isn't for the better. Where the G80 has Panasonic's now standard menu system, the G1's is, as you would expect, less comprehensive. In layout and logic, though, even this primordial version is well planned. It has a My Menu section, which is one of my favourite features of the Panasonic GH5. I was disappointed to find that unlike the GH5s, you can't populate it yourself with your most used items. Rather, it keeps track of which five menu entries you access most often and populates it with them. I can see why they dropped it subsequently. Accessing a menu not knowing whether you will find what you are looking for is frustrating rather than helpful. And what happens is, you don't use it. The Film Mode button on the top is a waste of space. On the G80 it is renamed Filter Settings and resides on the menu. I think that may have come about because photographers took the G1 rightly for a serious camera. And most serious photographers would regard the filters as fun but not core to their work. The monitor detail and colour is much better in the G80 as is the EVF. Which is also considerably larger than the G1s. Though the G1s is bigger than today's GX80 so perfectly acceptable. It makes the G80 much more pleasurable to use. Were a DSLR user considering a Micro Four Thirds camera would be unconvinced by the G1's EVF, they might well be convinced by the G80's. The area where I expected most progress to have been made was in the camera performance and I wasn't disappointed. The single autofocus of the G80 is uncannily fast even in dim light. This is literally a point and shoot camera. The G1's single autofocus is less confident but nonetheless perfectly usable and was faster than most DSLRs of the time. It is slower in action than the G80 and has a tendency to hunt for initial focus. The initial lock-on is where Panasonic's depth from defocus comes into its own and is well demonstrated by the G80 and the maker's 14 to 140mm super zoom. Continuous autofocus is the biggest difference between then and now. The high frame rate of the G1 is just 3 frames a second but that's with a focus and exposure set at the first frame. The more practical low rate, where focus is followed and predicted, is just two frames per second. Contrast this with the G80 with a 4K burst rate of 40 frames per second, a high burst rate at full size of nine or 10 frames per second, and full live view medium burst at a frame rate of six per second.
At the medium burst rate and viewed at normal size, the G1 had 7% of frames unusably off focus. The G80, shooting at three times the frame rate, had fewer than 1% unusably off focus. This test gives a good idea of what's going on because using the one focus area square, it is easier to keep the focus point accurately on the car. The hit rate drops at 100% viewing with both cameras, of course. But the 7 to 1 G1 to G80 performance ratio stays much the same. These bursts were shot at 1600 ISO at about a 4,000th of a second. And the G1's results are noticeably less clean and detailed than the G80's too. One thing that occurred to me when using the G1 was how relatively simple its menu system was. It has only 69 menu items, partly because of the lack of video, but even so the G80 has nearly 200 of them. The G1's top shutter speed, 1 4,000th, is the same as the G80's. But there's no electronic shutter, which on the G80 enables it to go all the way up to 1 16,000th. The g 80 shutter is a lot quieter to two, and you have the option of the electronic shutter for silent operation if required. In terms of the design, both are quite attractive, but I prefer the G80's more angular look. And although the size difference is small, the G80's height and better hand grip gives the impression of a much bigger, more spacious camera than the G1. The 12 megapixel sensor of the G1 yields a 4000 by 3000 pixel image, which gives a top quality print size of 14 to 20 inches across, enough for most purposes. The G80 extends that to 4592 by 3488, or a print of roughly 16 to 24 inches across, usefully bigger but usefully better quality too since I found the noise performance of the G80 about two stops ahead of the G1. Four million more pixels plus less noise is a win-win by any standards. In terms of price, the G1 sold for about £600 in 2008 with a 14 to 45 standard zoom, where the G80 sells for £799 including the wider range 12 to 60 mm standard zoom. A price hike of 25% in nearly 10 years doesn't seem too bad given the better lens and specs and is actually much the same allowing for inflation. Whereas you can buy a G80 body only today, you couldn't buy a G1 body only. It was for a good reason, because a body only would have been pretty useless then, given that the only general purpose lens available was the G1's kit lens. The 45 to 200 telezoom was released at the same time. How things have changed. Micro Four Thirds now sports a lens range after eight years that wouldn't disgrace a DSLR system with a half a century's development. Where the G1 is concerned, what strikes me is how much Panasonic got right from the word go and which informs the G80. Using the two cameras, the lineage is obvious, with the exception of the G80's ability to shoot not just video but 4K video, a step ahead of today's standard FHD. I can genuinely say that most of what I do today I could do with the G1. I would, though, need an APS-C or full frame camera to do some things to the standard I need. Picks in the Hadean light of my Blues Club come to mind. But the G80, I cannot think of anything I might need to do that I couldn't do with it. Plus it has bells and whistles like time lapse and 30 frame per second sequence shooting to enable me to do things I didn't know I wanted to do. The G series has come a long way in eight generations. Two things strike me on comparing them back to back. Firstly, how very different they are. But secondly, how very similar they are. Thanks for watching.